introduce Kunlay, our invited speaker this morning. Um, Kunlay comes to us from the architecture community where he was trained as a microarchitect. You, you can see, however, he's now moved on to got some taste. Well, Kunlay worked on transactional memory and thread speculation. He's also uh, largely responsible for the Niagara processor, which some of you may know as the Sun Ultra Spark. Um, back in like the early to mid 90s, uh, in the architecture community, super scale processors were considered the way to go. So uh, they were packing incredible amounts of things into uh, what was this horrible comparative interface. If any of you have ever tried to program this um, before, you know. But what was going on behind the scenes was this amazing parallelism, functional stuff to try to like online liveness analysis to try to figure out which two instructions you're going to be able to run in parallel. And Kunlay was um, one of the people leading the charge to say, you know what we really should be doing is chip multiple processing. In other words, we should have similar processors and more of them, and we should be opening this up to people to be able to program them. And so uh, Kunlay is largely the reason why there are approximately, I don't know, four to six times as many processors in this room as there are people. <laughs> so, um, So, so, all right, well, um, so uh, without further ado, perhaps, let's, let's uh, welcome Kunle, who I'm sure will bring much honor to this house. Good morning, and I'm uh, going to modulate my voice here. I speak loudly, but there's too much amplification here. So thank you, uh, Rob, for that uh, kind introduction. We established last, last night that he hasn't known me long enough to tell any embarrassing stories. Uh, uh, I didn't drink enough to actually give him any, so, uh, so I can leave it at that. So uh, first of all, I, I'd like to thank the uh, ICFP uh, Program Committee for uh, inviting me here to, to give a talk. And uh, second of all, I'd like to say that, you know, as you can tell from the introduction, I'm going to be talking about high performance embedded domain specific languages, but I'm not neither an expert in functional programming or an expert in, in programming languages. Uh, but I've had a long history of trying to make parallel computation easier to use, right? So a lot of my approaches have been hardware focused. And so, you know, finally I come around and say, well, what, about, what about software? What can we do in the software? So hopefully, uh, Based on, on my talk and the experience that uh, uh, I, I give, you know, some of you who are experts in this area uh, can actually you know, might be encouraged to do some, some work uh, to improve the state of the world of parallel computing, since it, it needs a lot of work. Okay, so uh, fortunately, I've uh, been able to work with a bunch of collaborators who know a lot more than I do. Uh, uh, Pat Hammerhan at Stanford and Martin Odersky at, at EPFL in Switzerland. And of course, uh, the PhD students who do all the work, uh, one of which uh, is in the audience, Tiat Roth, and uh, he's going to be handling all the tough questions. OK, so uh, let's start with uh, an outline. So first of all, I'm going to talk about, give some motivation for why high performance DSLs are approach that we think is really interesting. I'm going to give a short example, DSL, one of the first DSLs that we developed in our group. Uh, then I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about an infrastructure for developing DSLs uh, that uh, potentially make it easier to develop uh, a range of DSL compilers, and then give you a few examples of some of the DSLs that we've been uh, developing using this system. So let me start with some motivation. So today, all computing is power constrained. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, the mobile phone in your pocket, or the servers uh, behind Google, everything's constrained by power. And so uh, if you look at the, what's happening in the architecture space, you've got a range of different parallel architectures uh, that uh, have been developed to try and get the most performance per watt on a variety of different uh, uh, applications. And so you have uh, you know, at the top there an example of a multi-core processor, uh, Sun uh, Niagara 2 T2, which uh, uh, part of the group that I brought into Sun Design. And so here, of course, you're trying to take advantage of uh, parallelism on chip. You also see uh, an NVIDIA Fermi GPU, uh, which of course is, is uh, developed for uh, uh, accelerating graphics and a, a bunch of other scientific uh, computation. You also see an Altera FPGA. This might be representative of uh, uh, reconfigurable computing, which uh, a lot of people are interested in. And finally, you might have 
nodes composed of all three of the first uh, three architectures uh, combined in a cluster environment, right? So here you have uh, some sort of uh, distributed memory cluster environment where you can scale to, to hundreds or thousands or potentially millions of processes. So the issue from the point of view of programming is that each of these architectures needs a different low-level programming model, right? So threads and, uh, threads and locks in the form of pre-threads and OpenMP for uh, shared memory, some sort of data parallel programming model uh, for the GPUs, either using CUDA or OpenCL. If you actually want to take advantage of reconfigurable computers or, or uh, flexible uh, pro uh, programmable uh, logic, uh, then you need to actually delve down into the hardware level and uh, develop uh, register transfer level descriptions of your functions in uh, VHDL or Verilog. Then if you want to cross different address domains, you have to come up with some sort of message passing uh, programming model like MPI or PGAS. Right? So the state of the world for the programmer who wants to get at high performance is you have to delve down to these low-level programming models. So if I'm an application developer uh, who wants to develop uh, new uh, simulation technology to predict the future, either you know, look at how proteins fold or look at how uh, Airflow flows over an airplane wing, uh, or if I'm a person who wants to develop large scale uh, virtual worlds applications or, or personal robotics that deal with the, the world in real time, or maybe I have a huge amount of, of data that I want to analyze and uh, I want to be able to do this uh, with, with large amounts of computation, then I have to descend to the level of these low level programming models in order to get the uh, requisite computation and, and, uh, and, and get at the capabilities of modern architectures, right? So there's a, a gulf between where the applications developers are and where the architectures are. And so the question is, you know, that kind of drives uh, our work is, you know, is it possible to write one program? And, uh, or, or, you know, the hypothesis is, is it is possible to write one program uh, that uh, uh, can target all of these architectures and run efficiently on all of these machines, right? So that's kind of the, the first hypothesis. And it's, uh, we think this is possible if you use domain-specific languages. Now, you know, this is an audience where I don't need to say too much about domain-specific languages, since uh, many of you are uh, probably working in the area. Uh, but, you know, just to, to give a, a quick overview, so domain-specific languages have uh, programming, <coughs> uh, programming languages with, with restricted expressiveness for a particular domain. So they've got operators and data types focused on a particular, solving a particular problem, and they're typically higher level uh, declarative and, and, and potentially functional and, and deterministic. And so here are some examples. I think the best example is sort of MATLAB from the field of uh, uh, matrix and linear algebra, uh, but there are other good examples, SQL, you know, how, uh, for manipulating uh, Relations uh, in databases uh, and tech, maybe for for uh, uh, writing papers, right? So, so the question then is: so what does uh, what do DSLs have to do with, with high performance parallel heterogeneous computation, right? So it's not the fact it's not only parallel, but now we have different flavors of parallelism, and potentially going forward, we'll have even more flavors of parallelism as we continue to try and get squeeze more performance out of the limited power budget. Right, so, you know, traditionally, DSLs have been used to improve productivity. And so clearly this is one of the things that, that they bring to the table. They allow the programmer to focus in on specifying what the algorithm and the, what, what should do rather than the, the details of uh, the implementation details of the, uh, of the algorithm. So, so essentially specifying uh, what rather than how. And then, of course, uh, getting rid of the need to actually have the programmer descend to these low-level programming models. But then the question is sort of, you know, you really want high performance at the end of the day, right? And so if you get high productivity and you don't get performance, then of course you haven't really solved the problem. And so the question is how do you get high performance? And the key here is to try and match the high-level abstractions that you get from the domain-specific language to 
parallel patterns that can be efficiently executed across a range of architectures. And what's going to allow you to do this is the fact that you were started with a domain specific language with restricted semantics, and so it's going to make the translation easier. And you will also get to use the domain specific uh, knowledge to do optimizations that you could never do in a general purpose uh, language environment. And finally, of course, what you're going to get uh, from this sort of approach would be what we call forward scalability. So today, on your uh, laptop, you've got four or eight cores. Tomorrow, it may be 16 or 32. Uh, you might get a new architecture that, that's, that's, that's uh, different and stranger than the, the one that you have today. And the question is, you know, can you take the program that you wrote uh, before and, 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 uh, and run that on your new architecture? So DSL potentially give you this uh, capability. And they also free the architecture community to do more interesting uh, work to come up with new architectures. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you've got a new architecture with no software, then that doesn't do you a lot of good. And so here the, the idea is, of course, that as you come up with a new architecture, you don't have to change the program, but you do need to tra change how you translate uh, the application to the architecture, and this is possible in a DSL compilation environment. Okay, so here's the, the picture then. Uh, we have a bunch of different applications which are uh, developed by uh, a, a set of domain-specific languages, and each of the domain-specific languages ha has its uh, own DSL compiler that maps it to a range of different architectures, uh, the four that I've already listed, and potentially uh, some new architectures that, that come down the pipe. Okay, so uh, then you know, so. so We've been working on a, a range of different DSLs at Stanford. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Optimal, which is a, a machine learning DSL, uh, mainly focused on, on manipulating matrices and vertices. And uh, then we'll sort of talk a little bit about the performance that we get from this sort of approach, and then uh, tell you a bit about some compilation technology uh, that uh, is useful in, in translating uh, DSLs in general. Okay, so optimal. So this was a DSL. This was the first DSL we, we worked on, and uh, so we started in a domain that uh, uh, naturally has uh, descriptions that the people people use. So here it's a MATLAB-like -like language for writing machine learning applications, and so uh, the main data types, of course, that you're focusing on are matrix matrices and vectors, and so you can write very high level. Uh, descriptions like, like the one shown here. Uh, and then the idea then is you've got uh, implicitly parallel data structures, uh, vector, matrix, graph, streams, and of course, uh, in this example, we have a, a vector constructor uh, from uh, so a 100-element uh, vector. And then you also have some subtypes which are focused on the machine learning domain. So you've got uh, training sets and, and images and so on. Okay, so the key element that, that makes uh, the, uh, the, the language easy to use are these implicitly parallel control structures, uh, such as you know, summation, gradient descent, and sort of the iterative convergence. And they take an anonymous function, so here you see, of course, the functional flavor of, of the language. And, uh, but the, the functions have restricted semantics, and so the idea is that the semantics are enforced by the compiler such that you uh, don't put anything inside the function that would, uh, would, would prevent you from, from parallelizing uh, these control structures. Okay, so here's a, a very simple example of uh, optimal. In this case, we're looking at k-means clustering, right? So uh, the outer uh, control structure is, uh, is a uh, this is a till convergent and a convergence loop uh, based on, on the variable mu. And inside, uh, first of all, you calculate all the distance to the, to, to the current centroids by calculating uh, a matrix that has all the distances from the uh, points to the, uh, to the centroids. And then you move the uh, centroid uh, plus uh, centroids to the mean of the points assigned to it. So both in, in both the first uh, distance calculation and the, the movement of the uh, centroids uh, to, uh, of the cluster to the points assigned to it, 
we both have parallelism, right? So we've got multiple ground elements of parallelism. Uh, we have this, this, these high-level uh, uh, control structures, and we have this restrictive uh, use of the uh, indices, right? So you, you can't uh, just use indices uh, in, in any old fashion. You, the uh, compiler restricts what you get to use. Okay, so uh, so if you look at optimal, it's, it's declarative and it's, res it's restricted, and it doesn't cover. It, it, uh, I should say that the optimal is embedded in, in uh, Scala, but of course you don't have the full language to play with. You only have a subset of it, and uh, of course we have these uh, these anomalous functions, and we have to uh, guarantee that they're pure so that we can get uh, get parallelism. We also allow user-defined data structures. Uh, but again, we don't allow full uh, generality. Uh, we only allow structs, so no methods within uh, our data structures. And then we uh, allow mutation of objects, but only if you specify explicitly that you want to mutate a particular object. And so for this reason, this allows us to get uh, parallelism out of the description uh, implicitly. And uh, we can get very good performance on a range of different applications. And the, and the restrictions don't seem to uh, be too confining to the programmers who have used Optimal. So at the end of the day, of course, what you want to generate is something, is code that is going to run efficiently and looks uh, uh, you know, like Fortran, right? So Fortran programmers and Fortran compilers provide the best performance. And the reason they do that is that you know, Fortran basically has no higher order abstraction. Uh, you know, all the loops are, are, uh, can potentially can't be fused or fused together. And you have first order imperative code, and all the abstractions have gone away. And so, ideally, what you'd like, of course, is to start with a high level DSL with lots of abstraction uh, that's easy for programmers to write, but at the end of the day, you want code that looks like this uh, that has no abstraction. Okay, and that's what we're able to achieve uh, with the DSL uh, compiler. And so, uh, the performance uh, that you might uh, get from, from this. Uh, looks like uh, this. So here we're looking at performance going from one CPU to eight CPUs. So architects like performance graphs like this. So you know, uh, you know, as an architect, I'm going to put a few up just to make sure that uh, uh, I don't uh, have my card taken away by computer architecture card. So here, here we've got the performance here. So what we see is going from one CPU to eight CPUs, and, and then a CPU plus GPU. So the point here is that from the same DSL code, you can target uh, a range of uh, different architectures in here, just, just two. Uh, of course, parallelism going from one to eight CPUs, and the same uh, DSL optimal input can also generate GPU uh, code, uh, net or CUDA code to run on the, on the GPU. So what we have here is uh, uh, performance of optimal versus parallelized MATLAB versus C++, just to, uh, to convince you that, that, we're not, uh, uh, that we don't have a bunch of overheads, right? Because comparing to MATLAB might be an easy target, but uh, you also would like to see what C++ looks like, so to, to see what a, uh, a high-performance library might do. And so what you see is on one CPU here, we have uh, the optimal version at uh, one, and uh, the MATLAB is much slower. Uh, the C is, is a little faster, but of course the C cannot easily be parallelized, right? And so here, uh, the uh, optimal version can be parallelized and, and uh, eventually runs quite well on eight CPUs and runs even faster on the GPU, even given the transfer time um, of moving data between the CPU and the GPU. So that's k-means, which uh, requires a lot of optimization uh, in order to get good performance. Here's another example, which is restricted, which is a restricted Boltzmann machine example. And here, the calculation is basically dominated by matrix multiplier. So here is an example where you'd expect uh, MATLAB to do pretty well, and in fact it does, right? And so uh, we all start around one. The C is a little faster again, but of course uh, doesn't uh, parallelize, and MATLAB scales pretty well. So in the event that uh, MATLAB works well, Optimal also does well, and in many cases uh, where MATLAB does not do well, Optimal also does well. So the idea is you are starting from this high-level uh, abstract description in both Optimal and MATLAB, but of course Optimal has the ability to get 
to a much higher performance uh, result because it uh, is generating code that is uh, designed to run really well on parallel computers and can be targeted to a range of different architectures. Okay, so hopefully I've given you some motivation for uh, the, the power of, of DSLs. And now the question is, okay, so now I want to develop my own DSL. I've got some domain that uh, looks interesting and I think it, it could benefit from a high-level uh, description that might be mapped efficiently uh, to a range of different architectures. And so now I have to figure out all the six sorts of things that I need to do to figure out how to optimize my DSL. Right? And so I've got to think, think about all my base <coughs> source of compiler optimizations. I've got to think about uh, uh, domain-specific optimizations that uh, correspond to my particular problem. I have to think about code generation to a bunch of diff different targets. Uh, and at the end of the day, I might think, well, this is too hard. Right? So uh, uh, yeah, too much work. Uh, it's not clear that given my user base, uh, this is worth doing, right? And so the question is, how can we make it easier to develop high-performance DSLs, right? And so we, I've shown you this picture, uh, and this picture shows a set of different DSL compilers for each of the uh, DSLs that you develop. And so uh, the question is, you know, is there some commonality that you can pull out that uh, can enable uh, DSL developers uh, an easier time of developing new DSLs. So the second hypothesis then that kind of drives uh, the research we're engaged in is uh, it is possible to significantly simplify DSL development using a common DSL infrastructure. Okay? And so uh, the DSL infrastructure that uh, uh, we, we're looking at uh, you know, would sort of span the range of DSLs and pull out the commonality and uh, make it uh, reusable uh, across a number of DSLs. So here, uh, the uh, environment that the framework that we've developed is called Delight, and it's organized uh, array about, uh, around uh, a number of, of sort of common principles, right? So one is, uh, is a common intermediate representation, and a way of structuring both the computation and the data. A set of generic optimizations that uh, uh, work on the common IR and, and, and the structured computation and data. Facilities for uh, specifying domain-specific uh, optimizations and heterogeneous code generation. Uh, and, and these are all uh, implemented using a set of reusable components, right? And so we, at the end of the day, the idea is to have these components be reusable across different DSLs such that uh, you can build a high performance DSL with a lot less effort. So I'm trying to convince you on this fact. Let's look at uh, the Delight environment, Delight framework, and then show you a few DSLs that we've developed using this framework and tell you a bit about uh, how it made DSL development easier. Okay, so the first thing is uh, a common IR, right? So the idea is to embed uh, the DSL inside a powerful uh, programming uh, language, and the one that we have to be using is this Scala, right? So the idea then is to uh, take a description of uh, your application uh, as a DSL, such as the one shown here, which uh, has two uh, vector constructors and then uh, sums the vectors together and prints the result. And the idea then is to use uh, types to, uh, instead of uh, executing the description, uh, you, you generate uh, the uh, uh, intermediate representation. So here the idea is, is that you wrap the user. So all DSLs, of course, have you have uh, DSL-defined types, right? So, so the idea then is to take operators on these types and uh, convert them into an intermediate representation. And so uh, you wrap the, the types of interest uh, in a wrap, which is an abstract type constructor. And uh, then when you run the program, instead of executing the program as normal, you instead develop uh, or, or generate a 
intermediate representation, as shown here. Okay? So now you have an intermediate representation. Uh, now, what does that intermediate representation look like? Well, it uh, actually has uh, some sort of uh, C of nodes representation. And it it, you can think of it uh, as, 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 as operating on, at, at, at multiple views uh, at the same time, right? So one view is the view of the uh, domain level, right? So here we're talking about the, the nodes being uh, domain operators, such as uh, in this example, uh, coming from matrix and linear algebra, matrix plus, matrix sum, uh, and, and matrix uh, vector exponentiation. And then another view of the IR is that uh, what we call the delight op view. These are parallel uh, patterns, uh, in this case data parallel patterns, zip with map, reduce, uh, and uh, you know, some non-data uh, parallel uh, ops, divide and conquer. And these are all uh, uh, defined as, as extensions to a generic op uh, that, that uh, is a definition, right? So you can view the IR at uh, these multiple uh, these multiple views all at the same time, and this allows you a, a great deal of, of power in doing the optimization of the IR. Okay, so let's start with the principles and say a little bit more about how they uh, get implemented, right? So the first is this notion of, of, of structured <laughs> patterns, right? So here the idea is that the DSL author is going to map the DSL uh, operations, the domain operations, into these parallel patterns, right? So the way to think about this is, you know, we have a division of labor. Uh, we have the DSL author who focuses on figuring out where there is parallelism uh, in their application and then picking the parallel patterns that match uh, where, where out, picking the domain operators and, 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 and figuring out how they map to these parallel patterns. Okay, you can think of this as domain decomposition, right? So instead of the, you know, a traditional a parallel programming, you, you think about the, the, the end user developer has to think about this mapping. Here, the DSL author thinks about this mapping of DSL, uh, of domain operations down to these parallel patterns. And the current set of patterns uh, that we have are, are shown here. And uh, you know, we're currently working on, on, on patterns that are not necessary data parallel, like fork join and, and uh, pipeline. So you start with this structured computation, and uh, it's, it's the job of the DSL author to do the translation. And then you also have uh, data structures that the compiler system knows how to analyze, right? So these are C-like structs with a limited set of fields, and the fields are numeric, Boolean, string, array, and map. And here we have a simple example. And the key thing that we want here is we want to allow the system to, real, to, to reason about the data structures uh, in a symbolic fashion. And the key kinds of optimizations that you want to perform are you know, the transformation of structs of arrays to arrays of structs and uh, the elimination of fields. Right? And uh, this also so is really important in being able to translate code uh, to a variety of, of different uh, parallel devices, right? So you really need to get into an array of structs formulation, formulation to run efficiently on a GPU. And so this kind of transformation is absolutely necessary if you want to, to target that sort of architecture. So once you have uh, a notion of the operators and, and the data types, then let's start to think about the uh, optimizations that you want to be able to enable on your DSL. So you want to do all the good old uh, optimizations from, from your, your compiler uh, uh, class, right? So you want to do common subtraction elimination, dead code elimination, uh, constant folding and code motion. Uh, then you also want to be able to do parallel optimizations. So fusion, of course, is, is really important. It provides a lot of benefit both in uh, reducing the amount of uh, memory transfer traffic and, uh, you know, basically reducing the amount of um, uh, work that you have in to, to do in your parallel application. 
And then I've also, also mentioned the data structure optimization. So even though these generic optimizations uh, are well known, the big benefit that you get here is the optimizations happen at the granularity of domain operations and data. So you kind of a very simple elimination of an op if it was a, a uh, serial uh, addition would be not that important, but if you get rid of, or, of a matrix multiply operation, then of course you're going to get tremendous benefit in terms of performance. So you also, of course, want to enable domain-specific optimizations. And here uh, you have a, a, a couple of options. You can do simple pattern matching, right? So in this example, we have a uh, vector plus domain operation, and here we are, simple optimization gets rid of the uh, addition if one of the uh, operands is zero, right? Here then you just return A, and then of course if it's not the case, then, then you just use the, the uh, same, you just generate the, the normal IR, so using this uh, super dot vector plus uh, method call. So you can do simple uh, rewrites of the intermediate representation, such as the one shown here. But typically, if you want to do anything sophisticated, of course, you need to see more of the IR. And so we support traversals. And here, you know, you've got the C of nodes IR, so you need to schedule it and then uh, uh, walk it. And you can do, do this based on uh, an order defined by the, uh, by the DSL. So, so actually, traversing the IR and collecting information is, is often uh, important, and then you might want to transform the IR in some way. And so uh, transformers are basically traversals that also change uh, the, the IR. Right? So you've got rewrite rules. So as you create a new IR, then you can uh, apply these re rewrite rules, and, uh, or new rewrite rules, and this would be called a transformer. So you have both uh, simple rewrite ro rules, tra traversals, and Transformers. Okay, so lastly, you also then want heterogeneous <coughs> code generation. Of course, these are as a key facility required by the uh, domain specific uh, <coughs> language compilers in order to target a variety of different uh, architectures. And here, what we want to do is generate this first order imperative code, right? So we want to uh, strip away all the abstractions and, and generate code to a variety of different devices. Right, so currently, today, we generate Scala, C++, uh, and uh, variants of C++, like OpenMP uh, and MPI, which is uh, uh, currently in development. And we also generate CUDA and OpenCL. Right? And then we're also thinking about uh, generating Verilog. Uh, so here, of course, you need to do more work uh, to convert to a hardware level description. So once you've uh, generated uh, your code, you have two artifacts. You've got an execution graph, which is basically a kind of a data flow representation of a program. And here you can potentially have task parallelism between the, uh, the, the different nodes. And then you also have kernels, and these kernels can be uh, generated in, a variety, in, in multiple different, uh, uh, with multiple different uh, types of code, right? So potentially the same kernel could run on the CPU uh, uh, in, in its generated as a CPU for the CPU as C++ or could be generated for a GPU as CUDA, CUDA and then dynamically you could decide where you want to actually run this kernel and of course uh, it would be left to the runtime to decide how to group the kernels together because of course once you decide to run a kernel on, on the GPU you may want to run other kernels on the GPU uh, in order to amortize the uh, data transfer overhead. Okay, so here's the overall view of the Delight uh, compiler system. So you start with a DSL, which uh, defines uh, operations and data structures, uh, and these uh, <coughs> operations are defined in an intermediate representation that has multiple views. Uh, you uh, transform this IR using uh, generic and domain-specific optimization, uh, using analyses uh, and, and transformers, and these, these are basically based on traversals. And then one, at the end, the, the last kind of 
uh, transformer you have is a code generator, and the code generator uh, generates a delight execution graph or a, a delight execution graph, and uh, each of the uh, nodes of the graph could be uh, kernels that are generated in, in multiple different programming language, low-level programming languages, uh, such as uh, CUDA, OpenCL, uh, C++, uh, etc. Okay, so, so that's kind of a quick overview of the uh, Delight uh, compiler framework. Uh, now I want to say a little bit about a few programming uh, DSLs that we've developed using this framework and uh, say you know, how uh, these DSLs uh, uh, use the framework and, and then what sort of benefit you get from doing things with the framework versus doing a uh, standalone DSL. So as you'll see, some of these DSLs have a counterpart DSL which it, which it was derived from, uh, which was a standalone DSL. So we can actually compare you know, what was the effort to do a standalone DSL versus uh, one that, that's embedded in, in, a, in a functional programming language. So the first uh, one is called uh, Optical, which is basically a, a data query uh, DSL. The second one is uh, for graph analysis, uh, called Optigraph. Uh, the third is uh, for uh, partial differential equations on meshes, called OptiMesh. And the third one is, is a collections library that's been optimized, uh, called OptiCollections, right? So you notice the common prefix here. <laughs> Okay, so the idea is to kind of just show you a diverse set of DSLs, and uh, these DSLs, as you'll see, perform non-trivial optimizations, and they also achieve very good performance, right? And so at the end of the day, you know, when I, I talk to, to people who think about using DSLs, they're really interested in, in achieving high performance. And the only reason they want DSLs is because they don't want to have to write low-level code for a variety of different architectures, right? And so if you don't give them good performance, then they really will go back to using the low-level code as much as they hate it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the other kind of, kind of uh, other goal is, of course, to, to simplify the development of DSLs. And uh, lastly, if I have time, I'll talk about some new facilities that we've been develop developing for uh, extensibility and interoperability between DSLs. So first of all, let's start with uh, this uh, query language uh, DSL, which is basically, uh, you know, based on link, right? So link for objects, right? So you have your basic SQL-like uh, operations uh, where group by, select, uh, and uh, order by. And here we're, we're talking about some in-memory uh, data structure, in-memory object, which has a, a, a table organization with a user-defined schema, okay? And so uh, there's a direct mapping then between these uh, SQL uh, operations and the parallel ops that, that we have, map, reduce, filter, sort, hash, join. And the big optimization that you want to, to uh, do is fusion, right? So you've got a lot of intermediate data, and the, the, the intermediate data is large, right? So it completely blows out your cache, right? So what you want to do, of course, is to fuse operations together and reuse the data in the cache and get much better locality and uh, Fusion does that. The only other thing you want to do is to eliminate fields that are not being used in your table based on the query, right? So that's the other optimization. Kind of, so this is kind of a uh, generic optimization that is provided by Delight, and then this optimization is one that is specific. Uh, well, it's also somewhat, it's also generic, uh, and it can be applied to, to other DSLs. So what sort of uh, performance benefit you get? So a couple of queries from TPCH. Uh, and here we are comparing to Link. Link is running, of course, on the C-sharp. And Optical is uh, generating Scala running on the JVM. And uh, what you see again is execution time, right? And the one uh, case is, is uh, one processor running uh, Optical. And you see a lot to better performance. And the performance improvement is due, again, to this fusion capability, the ability to, to fuse operations, and the fact that we eliminate the uh, fields, right? And so uh, you get a lot of benefit with query one, less benefit with query two, since query
32 is working on strings, and, and so uh, the elimination of the, uh, the, the fields uh, that are not being used is less uh, beneficial, but still uh, significant performance improvement over a similar uh, DSL capability. So, you know, there's lots of performance improvement potentially. There's even more performance improvement that you could get. So you could actually do query <coughs> optimization uh, as a domain-specific optimization, but we haven't done any of that yet. But uh, in the future, we, we could. So that's uh, the first example of DSL, again, implemented uh, with uh, the Delight environment using the generic optimizations and the uh, operators. And the second one is OptiGraph. So graphs have become a very important uh, uh, data structure for the analysis of social networks and a variety of, of other uh, sorts of applications. And so uh, um, we recently wrote a, a paper on a graph DSL called GreenBar. So this was a uh, DSL which was a st standalone DSL developed with its own compiler. Uh, and so uh, the idea is that could we take that same DSL and use the embedded uh, approach, right, uh, using delight. And so we kind of look at this DSL, it's got directed and undirected graphs with nodes and edges, and then the uh, nodes, nodes and edges could be a set, could be some uh, sequence or, or some uh, sequence with, with a particular order. And one of the big things that uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the green model gives you is this notion of deferred assignment. Uh, so that you can get uh, bulk synchronous uh, memory semantics and uh, also gives you parallel reductions, right? And so we've, we've got these same capabilities in OptiGraph and uh, the main parallel construct is a for loop or, or sort of for each loop and uh, so we use uh, the parallel ops for each reduce, filter, map and reduce is a very simple example of, uh, of OptiGraph doing the page rank algorithm. So for all the nodes in the graph, you know, compute the rank and uh, you, you know, sum over all the uh, parents of the particular graph node. And so here you see both uh, deferred assignment, right? This means that, that, you know, the PR is not updated until the end of the loop. Uh, and uh, we also see um, a reduction operations that, that get optimized uh, in a parallel way. So what sort of performance do we get? So here we're comparing to, uh, to Green Mile. So Green Mile's already shown that it can actually do better than writing a uh, code uh, explicitly in parallel. Here we can, Green Mile's been compared to uh, explicit coding of graph algorithms using OpenMP. So here we compare OptiGraph, which is of course a DSL modeled after Green Mile, uh, and, and what we see is that for the page rank uh, algorithm with uh, uh, 100,000 nodes and 800,000 edges, uh, we basically get the same sort of uh, performance as uh, the uh, green bar uh, with, uh, with a larger number of, of, of uh, nodes and edges. Uh, green bar is slightly better. Uh, on one processor, and we think this is mainly due to the difference between C++ and uh, the Java version of C, uh, but uh, then as we, we scale, the performance uh, is roughly the same. So the point here is that you can use the delight approach, which of course is based on the uh, uh, environment that I just described, and get uh, and, and develop an embedded DSL and get performance which is just as good as uh, a standalone DSL coded uh, explicitly, uh, standalone DSL compiler coded explicitly for uh, a particular DSL, in this case, uh, Green Mile in C++. Uh, another example DSL that we've uh, looked at is called OptiMesh. And this uh, DSL comes from the scientific computing domain. So here the idea is you want to simulate uh, a, a, a jet engine that is meant to, to go at, uh, uh, at, uh, at the at atmosphere at Mach 6 or Mach 7, right? And so uh, what you have is, is a mesh uh, and uh, a PDE solver. And the idea is the mesh is abstracted, right? And so you don't look at the mesh 
uh, by looking at the uh, underlying array elements. You describe the mesh at an abstract level in terms of cells and faces, and then you have structured access to the mesh, mesh by using uh, structures like, uh, like uh, head and tail. And the key parallel operation is a for loop, which also has reduction. And so uh, we map that to a for each reduce. And we also uh, use map, reduce, and zip for the vector matrix arithmetic. So here's an example. So the idea is that, that you uh, define uh, fields based on the uh, elements of the mesh. And here we're iterating through all the edges of the mesh. We're calculating some flux through the edge. And we're assigning it to the head and tail uh, vertex of the uh, associated with the edge. And then we're uh, you know, uh, updating some flux values. So it turns out that you, know, you could have two edges which, uh, it, it, which are connected to the same vertex. And this might cause potential um, conflicts in this parallel loop. And so you need to, to analyze it more. Uh, you need to do more analysis in order to get rid of, of all the, the conflicts, right? So you've implicitly parallel operation, these built-in conflict logical operations, and as I said, potential right conflicts in these uh, last two statements here. And so the idea then is to analyze the mesh computation to figure out what the stencil is, right? So you want to understand what the memory reference pattern is, and you're going to base this on the actual mesh that you happen to be computing with, right? The computation is going to take a long time, and so you, uh, it is actually beneficial to do this kind of analysis. So you're basically going to look at the uh, input data. Uh, you're going to understand uh, how the uh, data access pattern uh, it, by, by, works by symbolically executing uh, the, the code uh, based on the, the input data. And then you are going to color the loops to get rid of the conflicts, right? And so this basically just shows the traversal and transformation code that is used uh, inside uh, the inside OptiMesh in order to do uh, the, this transformation. And I think the interesting thing here is that in order to specify the transformation, you don't have to directly manipulate the IR, you can specify the transformation as text and then just restage it to generate the IR dynamically. So this is a, a benefit from the, from the point of view of kind of using the light environment and that actually writing the transformations is potentially much easier than you would have to do if you actually had to manipulate directly uh, the IR. Okay, so what sort of performance uh, improvement do we get? So there's a couple of, uh, uh, of, of uh, simple uh, applications that, that uh, using OptiMesh. And here we're comparing uh, on GP. These are all running on, so, so the, the OptiMesh uh, and the list are both running on the GPU. And we also show the single processor OptiMesh, uh, sorry, list G CPU case, just to show that you get a tremendous benefit by running on the GPU. Here you've got lots of computation, uh, and, and so you can amortize the data transfer between the uh, CPU and the GPU, and so at the end of the day, you get a lot of benefit uh, from using the, the GPU. And uh, the list version is slightly faster, mainly again due to the overhead of Java. Okay? However, it was certainly within the ballpark. <coughs> And uh, we're currently working on generating C directly, right? So today we just generate C level kernels and they are pulled from Java. Uh, so in the future we'll completely eliminate uh, the Java code and so of course you'll get uh, rid of the overhead and then you'll get the same performance as uh, the list version shown, shown here. So pretty good performance within 20%, uh, but uh, there are overheads. So lastly, the last example is a, a DSL, which is not really a DSL, it's basically taking a subset of the Scala Collections uh, library and using staging and static uh, compilation to optimize its performance, right? And so the idea then is that the code you start off with is just plain Scala, and then you're going to use the parallel ops that we've 
define that zip reduce flat map and so on, and the optimizations to optimize this code. And this kind of shows the performance improvement you get from doing that. And uh, again, you're just taking a standard Scala library and optimizing it using the delight compiler approach. Okay? And uh, you get, even though uh, the, the library is already fairly optimized, you can get significant benefits uh, from doing this. Okay, so the performance is good, as I've kind of demonstrated to you. Uh, now let's kind of look at what kind of reusable components we see across the different uh, uh, DSLs. So uh, we have optimal, uh, which we, we started with, and then the four uh, DSLs that uh, I just introduced. And you see that they make use of the delight ops. Uh, uh, they each make use of, of uh, the delight ops, but basically, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of with this set of, of delight ops, we have fairly good coverage of the DSLs, and of course the uh, generic optimizations are also uh, useful across the DSLs. And then a couple of them, uh, such as OptiGraph and OptiMesh, have their own domain-specific transformations, which are uh, optimizations which are also implemented. So the point here is there's a fair amount of reuse across the different compiler uh, functionality. And uh, which shows that, that, that we are, in fact, we, are, we do in fact have these common components that uh, can be reused across the DSLs. So then the next question is sort of what is the benefit of doing an embedded DSL in, in a powerful uh, a functional uh, programming language? What kind of benefits do you get in terms of, uh, of, uh, of optimizing, uh, in terms of DSL? Development. You know, how much easier is it to develop uh, using this kind of embedded approach versus doing a standalone DSL development? So the best uh, comparisons that we have are between uh, OptiGraph and GreenMail. As I, as I said, uh, OptiGraph is derived from GreenMail, and OptiMesh and Lisp. Right. So both of the the Delight DSLs were developed by a single new PhD student who came in not knowing Scala, not knowing the domain, who said, you know, I, I, the student came in and said, well, the first uh, thing that I'd like you to do is to take this existing standalone DSL and implement it uh, in, in our environment. And they took them about uh, a quarter, which is about three months at Stanford. And they were able to, to do that. And uh, here you see the kind of uh, difference in, in lines of code. It's not clear that this is the best measure of productivity, but it's the only one that, that uh, we could easily come up with. And uh, so you can kind of compare sort of three months for a, a new PhD student versus uh, Green Mile took uh, one year with a senior PhD student who's really good. And uh, they did it in C++ in one year with, you know, with a lot more lines of code. And then uh, list was done by three uh, uh, PhDs. Uh, and they took them about a, a year. And again, it's a combination of Scala and C++ uh, with a lot more lines of code versus the OptiMesh uh, version. And then, of course, we're leveraging a lot of code uh, within the Delight uh, compiler and uh, the, the staging support called Lightweight Modular Staging. Uh, and uh, so you see the lines of code that are being leveraged uh, in the environment. So the point here is that you know, that, you know, by some measure, there is a, an easier development path using a framework uh, like Delight, uh, you know, enabled by uh, powerful abstractions in, in the underlying uh, programming language. Okay, so uh, lastly, let me just say a few words about DSL interoperability. Uh, so fundamentally, you know, you may not be able to write your, DM, your application using a single DSL. Right, so you may need to combine multiple uh, DSLs together. And uh, so uh, the way that we've uh, come up with doing that is to, to use scopes within Scala. So a scope is essentially just a block of code that would be compiled on stage and ex executed as a chunk. And then these scopes communicate with one another through global objects. So a simple example would be you might use uh, optical, the query language, to uh, get some data out of a, uh, some in-memory uh, database. 
uh, and uh, then you might uh, run uh, linear regression on the uh, order data using the uh, optimal DSL, right? And so here you kind of define some So here you define uh, uh, the global data, and then uh, you use that to, to communicate between the two different uh, DSL scopes. And then the DSL scopes are then going to be staged and compiled independently. And then at the end, we have standard old scholar. Right? So the idea is we've got code that uh, is not performance uh, critical, and so you just want to write it in your base uh, embedding programming language, and you need some way of supporting that. So that, <clears throat> then you also have the so the ability to you know develop DSLs in a modular fashion, such that you can uh, decompose the DSLs and use parts of one DSL and another DSL. Uh, so we were able to do that. So. You know, we started out with, with Optimal, which is, was this DSL which focused on matrix and linear algebra, and we decided that, the, you know, the matrix and linear algebra was a very important component that might be used in another DSL. So we we're also working on one for, for complex optimization, for example. And so the idea then is you take out the uh, matrix and linear algebra component and uh, uh, the uh, facilities of, of Scala uh, in particular, the idea of using traits makes it uh, fairly uh, easy to do. So let me summarize then what I've told you. So uh, so idea is using DSLs both to support high productivity and high performance. And the key is high level abstractions without the regret of low performance. In fact, the idea is that you should be able to focus on the highest performance platforms uh, that the people are interested in. Right. So in the high performance community, Computing community, there's a lot of interest in DSLs, but clearly, if you're targeting millions of processes, you can't afford any inefficiencies, right? And so, you want to be able to get the performance that you would have gotten had you decided to code uh, directly to the low-level programming uh, language, and so that's the ultimate goal. And then sometimes you might, even, in fact, be able to do better than the uh, the uh, low-level. Uh, uh, program was able to do because you can take advantage of domain specific information that maybe the low level uh, programmer uh, did not have uh, available to them. Right? So the idea then is uh, build DSLs by uh, embedding them in, in uh, powerful functional languages. Uh, what you want to, is uh, a flexible and overloadable syntax that uh, allows you a lot of freedom in how you describe the DSL. You want an expressive type system because of course that is going to enable you to do uh, uh, interesting staging uh, sorts of operations, and you want to have some modular development capabilities so that you can uh, layer multiple components of your DSLs together and, and mix and match the capabilities, mix and match the capabilities of your, your different DSLs. Uh, so we think that uh, you know having reusable uh, components is going to be a key element of making this uh, tractable for many people potentially to do. And uh, the example, uh, which is you know, just you know, our first uh, stab at this idea, is, is this sort of common IR with, with optimizations. Uh, parallel patterns as a way of structuring your parallel computation. Uh, and of course, structured data. Right? So you need both the computation and the data. And you'd like to be able to have these, these components that can be uh, reused across different DSLs. And the important thing is that if you then, as a DSL author or developer, if you map your domain abstractions to these parallel patterns, then you can get the heterogeneous code generation for free. right? Because the idea is that all these patterns have already been optimized for a variety of architectures. So the performance results are, are, are basically comparable with hand optimized implementations across a multiple uh, different uh, uh, domains. And we have some initial data, I would call it initial, uh, it's not uh, the final word, which basically says that you can develop DSLs in this fashion, 
uh, with less effort than it would take you to do a standalone DSL. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm done. I would be glad to entertain questions. If you're interested in more information, I direct you to the code. No, you can get the code at the, 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 the Delight repository. And of course, there's lots of papers uh, on a variety of uh, elements that I've uh, discussed here. And they're available on the uh, uh, Pervasive Carlson website at Stanford.